Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop in another fortnightly crane committee collapse water cooler discussion wherein us technical fa fellas get a confabulation as to what the fuck is going on. Uh, funny thing about cranes, I, I myself have slithered down the backside of some steel erections. Uh, they are subject to gravity and it's a joke that everybody falls for. But we had two crane collapses, something Toronto on terrible. Two of them right, right in a row. Having a look at the photos on the first one, uh, ain't no great mystery here. Looks like the luffing jib come down on a building while it was slewing. Twisted steel and sex appeal. Speaking of which, a typical job site after a accident. They got every swinging dick on the claim, including some firefighters. We got the fella here calling in the hot supper. OT, <laughs> double bubble. Got a couple of come-alongs here securing the thing so it doesn't fall off. Just about took out an apiary. Look at that, those poor little busy bees. In this pic, you can see the luffing boom come down while it was slewing. That is, while it was rotating. That's the view from the ground there. Not much to see. Oh, and the fellas, riggers taking her A part, making sure... Uh, Nobody gets dead. Here you can see it is a luffing crane on this back part of the crane. There's two drums, two winch drums, and you can see the pin from the A-frame of the boom back here behind the cab. Rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, four men in a tub. <laughs> They're practically tripping over each other. <laughs> Easy money. And from the look of that stove up boom, luffing jib, it looks like it contacted on the luff down and then continued to slew. So there was two functions happening at the same time, like that uh, John James McMurdo, uh, Choctaw, Choctaw Bingo song. He tried to miss him, but didn't quite. It's a matter of timing. Just didn't quite get the timing right. So listen, through 4,500 kilometers of intertubes, looks pretty cut and dry. One of two things happened, and we ascribe here to, subscribed here, to Occam's razor, of course, being the simplest explanation is generally the rightest. And also, don't ascribe to incompetence what you can ascribe to malice, or vice versa. There was no malice involved here. Looks to me like either a whoopsie happened, or the luffing brake failed under no load, with no wind conditions. And a relatively new crane or the control got stuck a fortnight the later we got the next crane collapse now the previous one was not actually a collapse but this one on the corner of dundas and donny brook i'm not real up on my torontonian heritage i uh, avoid that area as much as possible it being the center of the canadian universe however i do recommend it highly to any and all tourists there is absolutely no need to visit any other section of Canada, you'll get it all in Toronto or possibly Montreal. This is a gutter. The untouched basal section adorned atop with a slew ring intact, holy and beautiful, whilst the top of the crane soaks up a bourbon stain in the gutter. Pretty pug fugly, but as it was, got away unscathed. Just a couple of people uh, maybe needed to change a pantaloons. I saw, right? You just shake out the pant leg and you got a Hansel and Gretel trail to follow back to where you were. The workers on the site had noticed a couple of broken bolts on the slew ring and shut the site down, luckily, but hadn't gone uh, so far as to control the traffic on the street. So just by sheer luck that those holes in the cheese didn't line up. A slew ring happens to be a big jeezless bearing. What allows huge mechanical contrivances to spin them a thing. It generally got bolt holes on the inside race, on the outside race, as well as gearing either on the inside race or the outside race. And it takes up moment loads. So instead of there being some radial loading or some... Uh, it, it wants to twist the bearing half in two. I'll show you a diagram. But the big heavy duty ones, they got rolling elements that are set at 90 degrees to each other. And they're jammed in betwixt the between of the outer and inner race. The operational loading of a slew ring is not that of a typical bearing what would encounter axial and radial loads. 
and very small moment loads because the shaft would be going through it. There's no shaft going through the middle of it. So it is subject to extreme moment loads. And the moment load is the highest, well, statically anyway, dynamically is a whole different kettle of fish, but statically is highest when there is no load on the hook. That is, it's all counterweight. And you can see it wants to twist that bearing apart. That's hard on those fasteners. So they got to be tough and they got to be snugged up. A PC3000, that's an older crane, apparently a Pico. And I have the 14, 140 version here, 1400. That's tower crane. As you can see from the drawings, it's a certain vintage and that company isn't around anymore. Maybe got rolled into another company or divested or diverted or so forth. You know how it goes. But suffice it to say, it's an older crane. So older crane means older bolts. Here's an installation and maintenance of slew rings and special bearings a diagram from La Fontaine. La Fontaine. That's uh, Rolex bearings. They're a big brand name out of France. You can tell because the manual says Anglais. And there's a couple things you got to do. It's just the typical things. You got to torque in a thing. They recommend using a hydraulic torque wrench. Interestingly, there are no Belleville uh, growler or any kind of spring washer. They're absolutely prohibited. Of particular import, the fastener survey. It is important to check that the required preload levels of the bolts is still maintained as a fastener of the slewing ring are essentially working in fatigue. Rolling rec Rolex recommends the retightening of the fasteners after the first two to four months of utilization and then proceed to a systemic yearly check. If any bolt is found loose, further deep examination is essential. Now this is the fun part, but it's only fun because nobody died. The inspectors get to do the old Columbo. So you're telling me Mother Hubbard went to her cupboard to grab her dog a bone. Mother Hubbard bent over and the dog gave her a bone of her own. Much like a crime scene, the fellows what are on site, they already know what happened. We, however, get to do the Perry Mason routine. Us unclean masses uh, masturbating through the keyhole. We don't know exactly what's going on, but we can get an inkling, a few clues. They got to find the bolts. They have to find the bolts. That is the key to the truth. The matching pair of the busted nub and the fastener will tell the tale of the tape and no doubt much to the delight of insurers everywhere the call of metal fatigue will be invoked and of course the nut the broken end here there'll be about one thread there's an asymmetrical loading happening in typical threads where the vast majority of the load goes onto the first thread and then subsequently and you can machine different threads where all the threads take the load, but they're difficult to manufacture because you can't do roll thread and a bunch of different reasons. But this, these, all these bolts what are broken, they will be broken within one or two threads of that first thread engagement. And if you will allow me to do the old Columbo routine and digress, <laughs> I, I got to play to my strengths here and I, my, my superpowers is being able, able to alienate myself from the cool kids. So without further ado, let's get into a nerdgasm. Western Australia, mnemonic aid. Western Australia has a lot of mining. The capital of Western Australia is Perth, founded in 1829. W.A. Wilhelm Albert was the first engineered what discovered metal fatigue he was a well in that region of uh niederzack zone uh, lower saxony in germany very close to the ocean in ancient times of course that would have been a black smoker all kinds of sulfide minerals water going through the earth picking up minerals and then as it comes to the surface the pressure gets lowered it vaporizes, lets all those sulfide minerals out. So lots of galena in those folded heart, heart so good mountains in upper Germany. Lots of mining, lots of fantastic engineering come out of there for the past 
300 years. Now this fellow, Wilhelm, and the reason, well, Galena is a fantastic, it's lead sulfide, okay? So lead sulfide happens to have roughly the same density as silver sulfide, about seven, I think it's seven grams per something, something. Also happens to have the same uh, solvatability. It can dissolve in water at a roughly the same rate, also seven. So those two minerals desire, form in intrusionary, uh, a lot of granite through there. So they form in intrusionary veins, which the miners would then go in since ancient times would go in and mine this galena, roast it, roast off the sulfur, get the lead and then separate the lead from the AG, argent, um, silver, sorry. So <laughs> this fellow, <laughs> Wilhelm Albert, my brilliant mining engineer, gets the call in the middle of the night, goes to the mine, uh, wide-eyed miners dust just to settle in. Let me tell you something, partner, about men whom are tasked with going into the earth, digging through solid rock for kilometers in order to find that golden egg. Listen, partner, you just keep the paychecks coming and leave the rest to me type deal. When they have the what the fuck look on their faces, shit has hit the fan. So this Wilhelm Albert got to the mine and shit had hit the fan. One of the skips what loads ore to the surface, big monster chain on her, broke right half in two. Of course, you got to blame the fools on the tools sitting on their stools. It was the miners what overloaded it, hit the side of the drift or whatever. But he set to looking at the fracture and it was a real odd fracture. And the miners swore up and down that they didn't overload the skip. Now, how could you overload a skip? It's a certain, so well, you could hit the side, blah, 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 blah. He set to doing what technical why guys the world over do, discussing it like we do here, but also finding out why. And he discovered me metal fatigue, sorry, mechanical failure, metal fatigue in that a mechanical contrivance can fail at well below its rated load if it's cycled. So metal fatigue is a failure of a fastener that has been cycled a whole bunch of times well below its yield strength, but it still fails. What was I going to say about this? Oh yeah, so that caused him, this Wilhelm Albert, to invent wrought iron wire rope. Now wrought iron, of course, is essentially mild steel. It's, it's, pig, it's iron, cast iron, which has a tensile strength of 25,000 PSI and you beat the carbon out of it, you beat the hell out of it, you essentially turn it into mild steel. That doubles the strength. It goes to 50,000 PSI. And then you make long wires of it, and he took three of those, wound them together, wound those three strands together into wire ropes, and that eliminated those big monster blacksmith chains that would break under cyclic loading. And of course, the, the wire rope wasn't perfected until it got to England. I believe the guy was name was Newwall who developed actual wire rope. And to this day, it's such a fantastic tool. It's such a fanta fantastic machine. You take a piece of cable like this and it's, it holds up incredible load and it can bend around a shiv. You think about that solid steel being able to bend around a shiv and that's only because it is actually a device. It's a, it's a machine cable is a machine and it's so old that we still you don't think about this but when you buy a wire rope it comes in different ratings and those rating systems uh eip well first ips however many psi that's worth eip that's uh, 300 000 psi that can handle uh, tension uh, eeip 350 000 pounds tension and what does those those ratings stand for improved plow steel extra improved plow steel and we're still using those rating systems that's how old that is i mean the mind boggles okay so what we got to do though sorry is uh digression over i think we're safe we got rid of all the cool kids it's just just me and you now partner 
So let's make a pretend like I was engaged by an insurance company to do a third party audit on this here accidente. I don't ask too many questions, you know, food for my kids and so forth being what it is. But let's say an insurance company has a vested interest in that if the maintenance of the crane is not adhered to, then uh, they don't got to pay out a claim. Okay, so what would I do? I would approach this as a troubleshooting situation. Why did the crane fall off? Easiest thing first, the bolts were not properly torqued. It comes down to something as simple as bolt torque. And I will show you uh, very carefully and gently with a rubber band why bolt torque is so important. Now, consider the slew ring well, consider the crane. The crane is under the greatest load when there is nothing under the hook, when the counterweight is there. Oh, why not, eh? <laughs> so this is the slew ring. We'll consider this the point load. Uh, so we'll take a fastener. I never did pass art, but we'll make a little fastener here. And it goes through the slew ring. This is sectioned. We'll call this a, A, ah, it doesn't matter, whatever. And then it goes through, and then another section, and then it goes to a nut, like so. Okay, so as this counterweight slews around, this bolt is going to be cyclically loaded. It wants to pivot on this pivot, all right? I'm like, oh, that's a moment. A twisting or turning force, a torque. So this, low, this bolt is going to be under the, the moment caused by this counterweight. Okay, now here is why preload is so very important. When we're talking about metal fatigue, what they do with my rubber. So if you have a bolt that is say an inch bolt, uh, 12 threads per inch, that's a fine thread. It can handle well, grade five can probably handle 4,000, 40,000 pounds. We'll go to grade eight and say it's 50,000 pounds. One bolt, 50,000 pounds. So we know that the load is never going to go over 50,000 pounds. Let's just set it as this counterweight cycles through. We'll size the crane just so, so that each one of these bolts undergoes a maximum of 50,000 pounds of stretch. Now, if you... Do not preload it. It's loosey-goosey in there. And it goes to 50,000 pounds. Remember, you're, you're using clamping force as well. So you have the, the load, the force from the load, but you also have the clamping force from tightening down that fastener. Okay, so if you have no preload and you put 50,000 pounds of force on that bolt, it stretches. Remember, everything is a spring frame you fuck remember everything is a spring so we're gonna cycle this under 50,000 pounds you'll note that it goes right to the end of the healing mat right to the end of the healing mat 50,000 pounds it's a spring comes under Hooke's law it's completely linear okay now if we torque this to the proper clamping load what happens is it gets torqued to the proper clamping load. And now when we add that 50,000 pounds, it still ends up in the same location, but it only cycles this far. It only stretches this far. So I ask you, over a million cycles, if it's moving but an inch, or it's moving the full three inches, like I tell the wife, which is going to last longer? Obviously, the one where the bolt, the situation where the bolt is properly preloaded. Now, uh, another factor in that is if you do not free uh, preload the bolt, it's free to waller out the hole, and it also can get stress risers from the two plates moving like this. It gets a little pinch in there, it gets a stress riser. That is an easy spot for a crack to propagate. So you get a double whammy if you do not preload the fasteners properly. Now what I would look for, I would gather up all my bolts and I would match them up and I would look for something like this looking on end. I would look for, here's the bolt head. 
I would look for an initiation point or two, maybe a rust pit or maybe a fretting mark, some sort of stress riser. And then I would start to look for conchoidal marks, beach marks. I would also look for ratchet marks, which are tangential to the beach marks because remember, as the crane slews around, this gets loaded both directions, right? So it kind of bends over, it bends over, it bends over, it bends over, it bends over this way, it bends, it bends over all kinds of... So where these beach marks meet, you end up getting a double, triple whammy, you get a ratchet mark. So these beach marks, as it cycles, will continue to propagate until there's not enough meat left in the bolt and it completely shears off. And what you'll end up getting, very likely in that failure, is a little uh, shear lip. So if you look at the bolt sideways, you would see it like this. It would be sheared off flat with a little tiny shear lip here. That's what I would look for and that is the smoking gun to indicate that very likely these bolts metal fatigued but because they were not preloaded properly. Thanks for watching. Keep your dick in a voice.